a Viking spacecraft is being readied to land on Mars in 1976, carrying an automated chemical laboratory to sample Martian soil for life forms. The discovery of just one bacteria on Mars or any other body of the solar system would indicate that the whole chain of evolutions, cosmic, chemical, and biological, is at work everywhere. In that case, there may be other intelligent civilizations capable of communicating with us. In the impact on ourselves of contact with a, another intelligent civilization, how it might come about and what the effects might be, is now being discussed by serious thinkers the world over. This symposium at Boston University includes astronomer Carl Sagan, anthropologist Ashley Montague. Krista Stendhal is dean of the Harvard School of Divinity. Professor Berenson teaches a course entitled Search for Life in the Universe. Professor Philip Morrison of MIT co-authored the first seriously recent paper on possible modes of communication with extraterrestrial life. George Wald won the Nobel Prize in 1971 for his work in physiology. It is now okay to talk about life elsewhere or intelligent life elsewhere, whereas a decade or two ago, it wasn't okay. It was considered too speculative to be worth any investment of time. It's that the number of stars in our galaxy alone is so staggeringly large, of the order of 10 to the 11 or more. The probability of stars having planetary systems is so high, we think perhaps half. The probability that those planetary systems might be comparable with our own and that the stars have some kind of an echosphere, a sphere in which the radiation is suitable for life, that it's not too hot, not too cold, meeting the other criteria, seems so reasonable. These uh, bits of information that come from astronomy primarily, and then we join with the biochemists who tell us about the probable evolution of life here on Earth, the kinds of elements that are necessary for it, DNA molecules, and amino acids and the like, amino acids which have now been found in meteorites that uh, we have now found interstellar molecules floating out in the space between stars. So that you know the materials for a carbon-based life exist. We know that many of the building blocks of life in our own solar system exist off of our planet. If you put these kinds of probabilities together, it begins to lead to the sorts of conclusions that we started with as an initial premise, and which apparently no one on the panel has disagreed. And that is that life must exist in the universe, and it must exist quite abundantly. The most optimistic estimates, in the view of many, about the number of civilizations that there might be in the galaxy is of the order of a million, which means that only one in a few hundred thousand stars has such civilizations. And that would mean a billion such places just in our own galaxy that might contain life. And I would imagine if an advanced civilization wanted to talk to us, they would say, oh, well, look, those guys must be extremely backward. So uh, go into some ancient museum and pull out one of those, uh, what do they call, radio telescopes, and uh, beam it at them. In 1970, a study of the feasibility for picking up interstellar communication was made in California um, by a number of radio scientists there, as well as astronomers and others. It's called Project Cyclops. The outcome of that study was that the United States had the technical capability of building a large radio array, which would be able to scan the heavens uh, with fairly great resolution and, and power sensitivity out to a distance of many hundreds or possibly thousands of light years, uh, with the very distinct possibility of picking up a signal if it were there. Our present technology is able to detect ourselves anywhere in this galaxy of about 250 billion stars. So I think, first of all, there will be two great phases of this eventual time, which I think will come in 10 years or 100 years, or I don't know, maybe longer, when some satisfactory radio telescope work or something similar will acquire evidence of the deliberate beaming of a message, <coughs> protracted message, out into space. So I think that will be easy and, of course, extraordinarily important. You will know very little of what that message says, save that it exists, and maybe some general geographic information from how far away it's coming, from what kind of a star, where. 
And then I think that you will have pouring into the recorders, pouring into the recorders, week after week, month after month, decade after decade, an enormous body of obviously interesting and meaningful pulses. And you'll be able to read them slowly and fitfully because they will not be coded, but they'll be anti-coded. That's to say the people who designed them, the beings who designed them, will have thought very carefully how to make the maximum number of mathematical clues the best way to single out the meaning will be made available. I think the most important thing that it will, it will bring to us, if we can finally understand it, will be a description, if it exists at all, of how the beings disposing of great technology were able to fashion a world in which they could live and pers persevere and maintain something of, of worth and beauty for a long period of time. And finally, it would end our social and cultural isolation. To date, we have been bounded not only into our own countries and into our own small regions on this planet, but most assuredly within our solar system itself. If there are the tens of billions of other civilizations which the uh, predictions indicate might be, then we would join a larger galactic community. In 1976, we're going to be able to explore Mars for perhaps not so humble microorganisms. Before and after that, we'll be searching the planets and the galaxies for clues to fill in the new patterns we're discovering. The evolution of evolutions that has produced us and the possible millions of other civilizations. It is conceivable that a spherical ship will land in front of the Washington Monument and a figure with four antennas and otherwise looking like the uh, professional football player will walk out <laughs> and demand to see our leader. But I, I hope uh, very much that the, the universe of circumstance is wider than the rather shoddy imaginations of science fiction writers for 30 or 40 years. And I'm pretty convinced it is. We've not found their guidance so great in any but the most modest activities, like going to the moon, which is not very much. <laughs> the difference between the spacecrafts of NASA and the lurid flying sorcery of that old radio war of the worlds is the difference between science and science fiction. And yes, between war and peace. It's our own world which has turned out to be the interplanetary visitor. We're the ones who were moving out there, not with death rays, but with cameras. Not to conquer, but simply to learn. We are, in fact, behaving ourselves far better out there than we ever have back here at home on our own planet. <laughs>